Today's topic is about being a supportive knight. And it's a little bit of a, a return to a topic that uh, I've talked about in the past, about how to be a love warrior and maybe some of my perceptions and how that shifted. So let me take a step back. Um, in my past relationships and in most of my life, I have seen my partnerships as one where, whether consciously or not, where I'm trying to protect my partner, trying to save them from suffering or stress or inconvenience. And there is a absolutely valid instinct of love in that. You know, it's the, the child on the playground. You want to protect the kid. You want to protect this thing, this entity, this precious object of your love and affection. But it's kind of like, like a seedling. Now sure, you want to keep the seedling from being trampled. But if you are so protective of that seedling that you take it inside, then it does not get the sunshine that it needs. It doesn't get the wind. It doesn't get all the, the, the available root structure to grow into the blossom that it is intended to, it is destined for, that it is born to be. And so there is this profound aspect of love that requires risk, faith, trust, and allowing the object of our love sometimes to struggle. Now that doesn't mean that when someone you love falls down and is bleeding, you say, hey, that is your problem. You're never going to learn. You're never going to grow if somebody helps you. No, absolutely you help. Absolutely you come to aid. Absolutely you support the people and things that you love. Why, just last night, my lady was requiring the aid of a fair knight to save her from a dragon that was inhabiting her drain, and so I took my sword and pulled the demon spawn monster hair clog from her drain. And, you know, I felt pretty, pretty macho about that. So it's not that, uh, that love means not helping one another. It means that we avoid the trap of seeing someone else as helpless as requiring our help, of robbing them of the experiences that are required to become who they need to be. The story that I like to tell all the time is, is of the biodome experiment where the trees started falling and the scientists couldn't figure out what was wrong and looked for a, a some sort of fungus or mold or something that may have been some pest that may have been attacking the trees. And after all these experts came in, the only thing they could find wrong with the trees was that they were never exposed to storms, that they were never given the opportunity to get beat up and knocked about. And as they were getting whacked around in the storms, they would develop root structures. That would be the natural progression of a tree's growth. But because they had no wind, they had no storms, the, tr the roots never had the need to grow as deep as required. And so at some point, the tree could not become what it was meant to be, and they toppled. And so when someone we love is going through a struggle, it is important to remember that these storms are critical. That doesn't mean you go out, don't go out in the storm and try to help them. It means you try to remember that the storms are mandatory. So support her? Yes. Save her? No. And that was huge for me. That was a very challenging thing, and it was has been something that uh, did not occur to me in my life until this my most recent relationship. And when I really got that and what that meant, that true love doesn't mean that you protect them from everything. True love, real love, means that you believe in them. You believe, you have faith 
that this person is their highest self. And when they doubt it, when they stumble, you don't go, oh my gosh, now I see them at their worst and I need to join them there. You go, no, 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 I still see you and hold you in this highest self. And no matter what you are feeling, I know what you're capable of. And I am going to believe in you and hold that space for you to bring you back. When I first met B, she was an intern and she was finding her way in the world in many ways. Brilliant, beautiful, funny. And a part of me wanted to protect this precious thing. And I really was focusing on trusting and believing and holding my view of her to her highest self. And in the next year, two years, she became an entrepreneur and she started a business and the business grew and she grew a brand and she grew staff and she grew a reputation and she got accolades and she got press and she became the kind of woman that is such a, a vision of strength that she actually inspires others, she inspires me. This little seedling is now this mighty oak creating shade and fruit. And somewhere along the line, I started to slip and I started to forget and I started to get scared because this powerful princess caught the bug. And she was no longer satisfied with the small vision and she started getting a bigger vision and a bigger vision. As she got to one plateau, she looked to the next one. And my small thinking started to get scared about her. And I fell back into that feeling like I want to protect her. I don't want to, to, her to feel stress. I don't want her to struggle. I don't... And without realizing it, I fell out of the role of a supportive knight and started worrying and started trying to, to advise her in ways that would minimize risks. Instead of thinking, you think you can do it? Then I think you can do it. And... Let me be very clear that I did not play the role of getting her to where she is. I simply avoided the role of holding her back. This amazing, inspiring person devoured uh, training materials and online tutorials and studied with coaches and studied the industry and, and studied mentors and really powerfully showed up as someone who is ready to take the hero's journey. I simply avoided as much as I could holding her back or giving any weight to the tiny voices in her head or my head that might encourage her to think small or to discourage or to judge or to think that you can't. And the, the equation of her amazing uh, personal power and my not getting in the way is what created this amazing warrior princess. Now, to be totally fair to myself, she also fell a little bit into this trap of stress and concern. I think that in a lot of ways, the path of an entrepreneur is, this is part of it. If you are an entrepreneur and you are growing a business, Almost your entire life is about trying to figure out what needs to be better, what needs to be fixed, what is the next obstacle. I mean, it, you are climbing up the steepest of mountains every day. And the entrepreneurs that I know that are the most successful are the ones who are able to say, all right, here's an awesome obstacle. All right, here we go. We can do this one. Instead of the ones that go, oh no, another big rock. Oh no, another big rock. Because if that is the case, then every day you're like, oh no, another big rock. 
and I fell in a little bit. I fell into that a little bit of seeing this warrior climbing the mountain and going, another big rock, another big rock. Instead of saying, you got this one. How many rocks have you gotten over already? You know how to climb rocks. You got this. Because isn't that what we want in a partner? Someone to go, you got it? No, 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 okay. Actually, you, you got a handhold there on the left. Well, let me, okay, let me hold your foot here right now. Instead of saying, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Be careful, careful, this is too steep for you. The danger also of being in that entrepreneur path is that when you are so focused as you need to be on all the struggles and all the obstacles and all the, the potential problems, it's very easy to get into a problem-focused mindset. And in the crap or cone mentality, that means you're crap focused. That means you are crap focused all the time. It means you are constantly trying to figure out, avoid crap, avoid crap, chip away the crap, you know, find a better path. Instead of going, look what we did. Yes, cone, yes, cone, yes, cone. So I think it's really important for any entrepreneurial path or anyone's path, but especially an entrepreneur's path, to find a system where you take time, daily, weekly, something, to focus on the cone. You need to train yourself to step out of the constant feeling of, uh, to go, ah. At Fresh Realm, we have a Friday gratitude meeting where the company-wide we sit down and we share things we're grateful for personally and professionally. And I mention this whenever I have a chance to other professionals, how profound it affects the workplace. Because every other time of the week, we are so overwhelmed with the to-do list and the things that need to get done. And even as the tasks are exciting, it's still daunting, suffocating. And so when you, Every once in a while, know that you're going to set that aside, the to-do list. Take a breath and go, ah, look how far we've come. Look what we've done right. Look what you've done right. And just sit there, not patting your back all day, night, and all, all day and night, you know, every day, but every once in a while, making sure you do take a chance to go, ah, look at this, we're still here. Look at this, we got over that hump. Thank you for helping me get over that hump. Thank you for helping me get over that wall. And good job for you for getting over your wall. <sighs> cool, we good? We recalibrated? Okay, now let's take that task list, put it back on our shoulders, and do this, because we know we can. So, in my relationship, I feel like, well, a side note. I've always been really, I don't know, maybe kind of annoyed when people say, I'm an empath. Like, like it's a way of saying, oh, I'm a compassionate person. What are you, I, 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 know, I don't know what you are, but I'm somebody who's compassionate and kind and, and, and cares about other's feelings, and so I feel very deeply. And so, like, ah. granted, I'm not a scholar in, in the term empath, it just, it had a reaction for me. But... As I realize the experience that I've been having with my partner and others and how dramatically I, I sometimes feel the suffering of others and the stress of others, I realize, oh, maybe that is being an empath. And I think that we are all empath or empathetic. And, and I think that being aware of that may help me to understand some of my challenges. I know that I have these crazy fears of, of commitment to, to jobs, to people. And one of those reasons is because I'm so scared of tying myself to someone else's suffering that I have no control over because it feels so deeply and it feels so horrible. So I asked a good friend of mine this week, I'm like, you know, I'm wondering if maybe, it, you know, I'm an empath, you know, and they're like, oh, absolutely. That's your biggest strength and your, your worst weakness. It's like, huh. Anyway, um, 
this is my classroom right now. This is my opportunity to learn and grow. This is my opportunity to become a better lover, a better vessel of love, and a better person. Now, I feel like I just got a, a status report from the universe kind of reminding me that, okay, you got off track a little bit. You fell a little bit into fear, but that's okay. This is, this is the path of the warrior. Sometimes there is obstacles, and this time the obstacle is getting back to that place of faith and trust and real love. The warrior's journey, the love warrior's journey, is one of trust and of seeing the best in others and holding space for others to be their best. And so as I as I try to realign with this heart-centered path of honor, as I try to fully embrace the role of a supportive knight to my warrior princess, I acknowledge my stumbles. I apologize. For those that I have made the journey more challenging, I say, I am at your service, milady, and I love you. <sighs> Hopefully you have people and partners that are being love warriors assisting you in your journey and people that you can be assisting knights as well. Let's have a hug nation hug. So grab yourselves by the shoulders. And acknowledge that on this journey, so often the mind takes us into a place where we think we can protect. We think we know what's coming. We think we know what's best. Let's just acknowledge that our mind, our conscious knowledge-based thinking does not know what's best. Certainly not for others. And so having faith and practicing seeing the good, visualizing the best, that is the courage required to be a love warrior. That is the way we help people, not from saving them, but supporting them. Let's take three breaths, becoming vessels in the cosmic stream, letting the universe flow through us, allowing ourselves to be supportive without judgment, without knowledge of right or wrong. In through the nose. On behalf of Grandpa Caleb and all the love warriors, happy hug nation. Thank you. I love you. Namaste. I don't know if it was obvious, but uh, I didn't talk about the struggle that I had over the weekend, but um, I didn't get to this awareness um, of, of being off track except through uh, challenges. And so I'm grateful for my partner um, for helping me uh, being my profound teacher. Isn't that the case? The ones that we love the most um, and care about the most are sometimes the ones we push the farthest and the ones that get to teach us the most.
Oh, you know what? I never... I forgot to type into my... my... oh, man. I never s told people to come into the chat room. Oops. Oh, well. Whoops. People always love their toughest teachers, says Liam. Man, that is a, that's a deep thought. It's something I've thought about a lot because I know that, um, you know, I recently have been talked to a few people who are coaches and parents and there is a, a an element of that that I am a, don't really understand very well, but that part of the person who can put discipline and boundaries and holds you to a certain standard, even though you may be angry at them at the time, the respect and the appreciation that you have for those people in your life is um, significant. <sighs> Ms. Dredd said, ads during the hugs are the worst. You know, I keep meaning to try to figure out what's going on with my my YouTube account. My YouTube account has got some penalties against it because I used an REO Speedwagon song three years ago in a video with my parents skipping in it. And so they won't let me do hangouts, like the live hangouts you know, for multiple people, which I think would be a better way to do the live hug because um, we wouldn't have ads. But I haven't been able to get my account cleared yet. so. I apologize for the hugs. I agree that if the Ustream solution just isn't good, and I keep for, like I think about, oh, let's try to do something new today, and I always think about it, you know, Monday morning. It's uh. Patient says the toughest teachers have been my children. Speaking of children. Um, Actually, maybe I'll do it this way just for the heck of it. Actually, that's going to be a pain. I'm going to do this. Well, yeah, I'll just say, um, are we still recording? Dun, 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 dun. Uh, Dimitri and OT had a baby over the weekend. Little Diego de Garcia Shapiro. How's that for a romantic name? Uh -huh. So, uh... I'll be honest that the experience of people close to me getting married or having children is very intense for me. Um, as I am now, you know, approaching my 43rd birthday and do not have a home, a family, um, or a dignity. No, no, take that back. I have dignity. Um, but as I don't have many of those things of traditional, um, you know, you know, I, I sometimes push off the white picket fence, but there's elements of traditional life that are beautiful. And there's a reason why so many people are drawn to those things. So when the when people that I love dearly and are a huge part of my network and my support embrace and, and, and add to their lives family and, and uh, things such as this, sometimes it's, it's, it can be, while I, I feel joy, and I, I feel so much added love and I feel so much excitement about, you know, a baby being a part of my life and getting to be Uncle John to them or, um, or someone, you know, joining their life with a partner. I sometimes, I get stirred up and there's parts of me that, that get scared and get afraid and, and wonder if I've made, you know, question my choices. And, and so it's, 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 it's kind of a, a weird juxtaposition of, of joy and fear Probably similar to, not similar, but parallel to that that a new parent has, where actually it's probably a tiny fraction of it, and who am I to even talk about that? But I, 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 would, I would imagine 
that the the magnitude of added joy and fear with the addition of say a child is um, hard to even fathom. Brighty says that the my toughest teachers were my exes. I always think that it's unusual and a little like I have such powerful, beautiful memories of my past relationships. Now, were there struggles involved? Definitely. But as as Bridie said, you know, like I feel like it is in those places of of partnerships that the the most profound learning took place, and the and the, the deepest parts of myself were explored, and the the um, you know I got called on my shit, and I got um, so yeah, I, I'm in agreement that the, the people in my life that I, I owe the most to often are the ones who want to talk to me the least and have <laughs> maybe that says more about me, but I am grateful for my 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 exes for sure. Oh, Brady's saying the ones that he's tied to with children as well. That's even more significant. There is there's no more profound opportunity for surrender than a a ended relationship that shares a child in it. You know, you are tied like a Siamese twin to this other person. I have never been a Siamese twin, so maybe that isn't a very good metaphor. Nor have I had a child with or without someone that I'm still with. So this is me talking out my butt. Um, let's see, what else did I wanted to mention today? Um, it was, I had a really interesting experience yesterday, um, with my nephew. Uh, I went to go visit and Caleb, older Caleb, was playing this video game, Plants vs. Zombies, and there's this level that he has not been able to pass for many days. And he goes, Uncle John, can I show you this thing on this game? And I looked at his dad, I go, is it cool? And he goes, yeah, you can show it. And, and, and my brother's like, Caleb, are you sure you don't want to show him another something else? Maybe show him a different part of the game. And I, I it was kind of a tell about what was about to happen next. So Caleb goes to show me this level that he's trying to get past. And he's like, Dad, will you help me? And, and, and my brother's like, I don't, I, I don't know. And so, Caleb plays through the ground, plays a level, plays a level. He keeps, can't make it, and he keeps going, it's so unfair, it's unfair, it's so unfair, it's so unfair. And eventually gets to a point where he's crying. Like, so frustrated, he just, he just, he's, he's enraged. And, and it was good that my, I was thinking, like, holy crap. And then my brother goes, Caleb, did I ever tell you the time that I broke the J key off my computer? because I threw the joystick at it when I couldn't get past a certain level on Jumpman Jr. And I was like, oh yeah, we used to get pretty pissed at our video games too. But then I witnessed Caleb in this space that brought me back to these memories of these feelings when I was a kid. And he said stuff like, I go, well, let's do this. He goes, I'll fail at that too. And it was kind of like he had this I suck at everything feeling in his head. And that was his script. And that was what he was totally stuck on. And earlier, before uh, he played that game, we played this pillow game that I like to play with them where they, they stand on the couches and I huck pillows at them and try to knock them down. Or, and he tries to deflect them. And, I throw blankets over them, and it's kind of like, you know, it's like a pillow gladiator attack game. You know, standard stuff. But, so we played that earlier, and it was fun, and we were laughing, and we were giggling. But after this episode, and he was crying, he felt like all 
filled with self-hate, you know, self-judgment. Um, he was he was stuck, and I couldn't get him. Like he might smile for a second and go right back to it, and I could. As I'm watching, I'm like, oh, I remember that. I remember being so attached to my like self upset. And as then we kept we played the game, but he was in this place where all he wanted to do was deflect him, and he's like, only throw him at my hands, you know, like oh, like he he. He, he was doing it like obsessively like to block it. And anytime he didn't hit block one, he was like so angry. It was like, and in some ways it was this, this window. One, it was, it was, it was a, I haven't seen this in him before. You know, this is this kind of stage of youth where he's gone from easily to make giggle all the time into getting into kind of a funk, like a little mini mood shift. Not like a tantrum, but like like a little depression. And I remember that I used to get little depressions. And I remember I used to be so attached to him and I was just watching this going like, ah, oh, God, it hurts my heart. And it turns out that he didn't sleep much the night before and he was very tired and that played a huge part in it. And I saw he took a nap and then I got to see him later that day after a nap and he was cheery and fun again. But what a, what a beautiful view of how close to the surface this little angel's experience of life was on the surface and how fragile it is and how, you know, how these sophisticated and also very base emotions of, of humanness are there so early. It's like, ugh, it, it, was, a, it was a hard thing to watch. Um, I didn't know, you know, I'm like, I don't know how to make you feel better. I just know that I've, I've been there too. I, I, you know, speaking of the topic of today about, you know, I'm, I was talking about being supportive, being a supportive knight. And, you know, my only experience in that is with a romantic partner. But I could see how that is you know, times infinity with a child. You know, every time the kid rides the bike around the neighborhood, you know, you've got to, like, have that trust and that faith, that that knowledge that y you can't protect this thing and also let it grow. And that is... I, I have admiration for the courage of parenting in many regards, but specifically for, for that that path. Uh, you know, I've, I've a number of friends that have had children lately, and uh, a few of them have had rocky starts, you know, with ailments. Um, and I've been watching the updates of one of my friends, not a, a dear close friend, but I've been seeing his, his Facebook updates, and the in, just intense challenges of, of trying to, to save and protect and heal this incredibly fragile little thing and, and you know, speaking of empathy and, and what what a crazy exercise in faith that must be and no, no wonder people find religion in those times whether it is you know whatever religion it is it's that faith that I don't have control of this thing this path these circumstances and that if I let if I hold on as tight as I can or I let go, either way it's gonna happen the way it's gonna happen. And so I need to let go so that I don't suffer throughout. Whew. Patient says, it's kind of surreal. I know I see stuff like that in my daughter, hearing her say things I said at 13. It's like, holy, grr, the apple doesn't fall far sometimes. And that's, you know, every, there's so many things about, um, about who we are, you know, that is determined by how far we our apple falls, and it cannot fall that far. I, when I was pondering getting a vasectomy, a friend of mine, a woman was like, I love the way she phrased it, she said, man, having a kid is the most intense karmic mindfuck there is. And what she explained that she meant was, 
no matter what, no matter how perfect a parent you are, no matter how loving you are, no matter how many books you read, no matter how incredible you are as a parent, no matter what, you will give your kid issues. You will say something that they will interpret in some way that they will have issues about that they'll have to work through in the future. It is the nature of growth. A child does not become adult without going through some form of rebellion with some sort of, you know, the independence of an individual requires some sort of clashing uh, with their parents. And so, like, knowing that, knowing that, you no, know, what, you know, whatever you do is gonna is gonna you know, be put to it, have an effect. It's like crazy. I think about, you know, things in my current interactions with people that are absolutely influenced by the relationships that my parents have with one another and in their worlds, because that's, I mean, that's how you experience things, you know. I mean. Sure, I, I learned a few things from the Cosbys, but most of the way I realized how families work is from my folks. Very lucky that they are great people and, and very loving, but even great people who are very loving have their own quirks and their own hang-ups and their own fears and their own patterns that it isn't until you start to embrace them and live them that you go, oh, wait a minute, this is not the way the world is. This is the pattern that I have incurred. I have ab absorbed, but that doesn't mean it's absolute. I mean, I think a lot of that, that protection desire or the way that, that male-female interactions that, that I find myself stepping into is because of patterns between my parents. Works great for them, sometimes causes challenges for me. Liam says, my wife had my seven-year-old sit in his room for saying effin. <laughs> Not the whole world, we're just effin. And I had to go to her and tell her that it's me that should go sit in my room because that's whose fault it is. <laughs> I learned it from you, Dad. I learned it from you. Yeah. Patience says, the, the trick is to learn and get better with each generation. It's it's I it's interesting because I see just in in some paths of humanity it seems growth 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 and in some paths it seems like stunted you know and we see that you know, our 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 closed world where we have access to people all over the world and you get to see bigotry and you get to see hatred and you get to see genocide and you get to see like oh wow in some places in the world this ev evolving consciousness that we f we f may feel like in our communities is not happening everywhere but yeah i think that that is that's where the faith comes in of uh and and it's also that we don't have control over the whole world we have control over our world and so we need to learn and get better in our path and know that that will have ripples you know i know that that my brother is much better at expressing himself and feeling things and dealing with the emotions of being a human being than my father is my father's awesome but that's not his strong point and so i know that my nephews are going to be way more empowered to be emotionally sophisticated men and that's that's it's also a, a that's a scary thing too because i think the more emotionally available and raw you are that's also a fragile place too i know that there is um there is there is a risk in feeling too deep so I, I I hope that they I hope they they, they learn the tools and uh, embrace the support as they grow and and feel the, the the roughness of the world as well as able to share their gifts with it. Um.
Anybody in the chat room going to Burning Man? Dun dun dun! I'm Halcyon, and this is a 2014 Burning Man ticket update. As Nostradamus predicted, tickets once again was challenging. <sighs> There's a lot of anger and frustration that can stir up when we get to this state of the ticket buying experience. Strangely enough, those frustration feelings generally happen when you don't get a ticket. So if you're one of those people and you are angry and frustrated, let me try to say a few things. One, this happens all the time. Every year there is challenges in some way with ticketing. Every year, right after they go, uh, they sell out, which has only happened in the last few years, but every year since there's been a sellout, there is this crazy spike in um, scalping. And it's it's not a ton, but it's enough to make us really, really pissed. It's kind of like, you know, that that one crazed guy on TV who rants and, and you feel like it gets you so upset. Now, the whole world is not ranting like that. The whole world is not scalping their tickets, but there are examples of that. But it's a really good exercise to remember that that is not where you want to place your focus. You don't want to try to focus just on the things that are going wrong because there's going to be tons of tickets to become available in the STEP program. There's going to be more tickets that, that are sold later. Last year, there was, the, as, as the event got close, lots of tickets became available at face value. Um, I remember on Playa hearing that there was tons of tickets available on Craigslist. So I think that the concept of scalping is, is if those people are not very well informed. It's not a very good investment. And I think that if you want a ticket and you put the word out, more and more tickets will become available and you just need to, to believe. Um, getting super focused on the, the scalping, making your world about the what's wrong with it, is a dangerous place. I like to tell the story of my year, I think it was 2000 at Burning Man, uh, when my camp uh, Zara built this grandiose magnificent, beautiful structure on the corner of Two O'Clock and Esplanade. And we were entirely uh, covered with these black walls and we had live grass inside. We brought in all this sod, we had live grass, we had waterfalls, we had dance floors, we had hidden rooms. It was stunning. And on Wednesday, I think it was, we, we, we worked all year building this thing. And we, we got there early.